Well, I think if we were all honest today, we could admit that one of life's pressures that's universal to each of us is we feel an intense pressure to measure up. Hey everybody, welcome to SAC's online worship experience. So excited to be with you today. If you're new, if it's your first time, we want to welcome you. You're in the right spot and we continue today our message series in the Gospel of Mark called Jesus, the Son of God. And today we are in Mark chapter 9 and we're going to be looking at an incredible passage of scripture. Very interesting. I feel like we're really going to be blessed today as we spend time with God in his word and in prayer and in worship. So let's get ready to do it, everybody.
A reading from Mark. Jesus and his disciples passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another, Who was the greatest? He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be the first must be the last of all and the servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them. And taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The word of the Lord. Well, hey, everybody, let's begin with this thought. And I'm quoting... Every adult life could be said to be defined by two great love stories. The first, the story of our quest for sexual love, is well known and well charted. Its vagaries form the staple of music and literature. It is socially accepted and celebrated. The second, uh, the story of our quest for love from the world, is a more secret and shameful tale. If mentioned, it tends to be in caustic mocking terms as something of interest chiefly to envious or deficient souls, or else the drive for status is interpreted in an economic sense alone. And yet this second love story is no less intense than the first. It is no less complicated, important, or universal, and its setbacks are no less painful. There is heartbreak here too, close quote. Well, do I have your attention? That is a quote by philosopher, sociologist, and author Alan de Botton from his 2004 book entitled Status Anxiety, in which he names in simple, deep, and descriptive terms how beholden we are to desire, meaning, and significance in life and in the world. And of course, in a world shadowed by sin and death, the search for that significance and meaning is deformed Uh, even the smallest of desires, ambitions, and pursuits, twisting them and us and others in a brutally competitive landscape that makes us anxious about just about everything. DeBotten puts his finger on the pulse of our condition. He says, quote, anxiety is the handmaiden of contemporary ambition, close quote. The landscape of this contemporary ambition through the fuel of modern technology, smart devices, and instant access to the internet has accelerated and exacerbated an epidemic of anxiety in our culture in which we are both the oppressors and the oppressed. It's difficult to know where the line of healthy ambition ends and selfish ambition begins. Wherever that nuanced boundary is, it's clear that we constantly are blurring those lines. And in many cases, we completely lose ourselves in a world of desire run amok. Can I get an amen? In the epistle of James, James touches the heart of this very subject with blunt force descriptive realism. He says, quote, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask, close quote. We can all relate, I think, to James's words here, especially those who have ever been on a long car ride with children. Though our externals may compound our problems, we have to remember where the root lies. Like Jesus taught a few weeks ago, he taught his disciples in Mark 7, it's what emerges from the inside that defiles us. As much as we'd like to blame the externals around us as the sole factor, we have to own the fact of our own passions that are at war within us, as James describes it. By the time we catch up with Jesus and the disciples in our gospel passage today, Jesus' glory has been revealed on the Mount of Transfiguration, where Peter, James, and John were privy to be witnesses of this incredible event, and yet the disciples were still struggling to comprehend Jesus' messianic identity and struggling deeper still to grasp his message. For the second time now, Jesus announces that the Son of Man would be handed over, rejected, killed, and ultimately raised three days later. But the disciples, of course, were fixated on their own hopeful upward trajectory toward power, influence, and status, caught up in their own ambitions 
and unable to hear what Jesus is saying. The disciples are debating as they walk along and arguing over their status, their own status in Jesus' would-be royal court. Up to this point, they no doubt presumed, in spite of everything that Jesus was saying and doing and teaching, that Jesus would get around to handing out those positions sooner or later. When Jesus reiterates his certain path toward death, however, they at least recognize this may not be the best time to ask about their promotions, which puts the finger on our own games of casual appearances before others. And they came to Capernaum, the gospel says, and when he was in the house, he asked the disciples, what were you discussing on the way? The disciples, of course, were too embarrassed to admit what they had been discussing, but the question was largely rhetorical because Jesus was already, of course, painfully aware. In Mark 8, Jesus teaches that losing your life was the way to have and obtain real life. The ambition to gain the world, to possess and clutch, was the sure way of losing everything. In other words, significance, life, and joy are not to be found in what we conquer or possess. Here, Jesus reveals the meaning of true greatness in our passage today. If anyone would be first, he says, he must be last of all and servant of all. Status in the kingdom of God is exactly upside down from our present world. Or put more accurately, the need for status in the kingdom of God has been obliterated by God's own love and God's own declaration of human dignity and worth. It doesn't mean that there are no distinctions and roles in life. Some called to serve in the back and some called to serve in the front, for instance. But it does mean that whether in the front or in the back, it is our joy through the gospel to serve all. There are no insignificant people in God's kingdom, no insignificant roles to which we might be called to perform. Of course, our world as it is, is enthralled with a sense of status, of importance, of notoriety and fame. We elevate those on the stage. We devalue the work that goes on backstage. Jesus says, don't be fooled. If you're playing the game of the world, as it describes it, you're looking for a status upgrade to impress the world. A temptation when and where Christianity is culturally dominant, by the way. But you won't get that status by following Jesus. To emphasize this point, Jesus illustrated uh, this by bringing a child into their midst, holding the child closely in his arms. Jesus says, quote, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me, close quote. Now, here we have to deconstruct our understanding of the status of children in our day compared to the general view of children in the ancient world and all the way up, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, just about until and through the Industrial Revolution. In our day, kids have a remarkable societal status. Our world revolves around them. In the first century world, they held little or no status. They may have enjoyed a modicum of family affection, of course, there, but there were no rights except what the father granted. It was ethically and morally permissible, for example, to kill your baby via exposure if it appeared sickly or if the gender was not preferable and if you had a compelling reason. Kids were generally viewed as a nuisance until they reached an age in which they could be helpful or productive. So Jesus' point here is about turning the notion of status upside down. Greatness isn't stepping over others to get to the top. It's not in getting our way at the expense of others or our own souls. It's about serving others all the way to the bottom. It's about the freedom to serve without regard to the world's measures for greatness. It's not anti-achievement, though. It's not anti-ambition, necessarily, or even anti-competition. Greatness finds its rest on God's terms, not our own. Jesus demonstrates this over and over, blessing the poor, healing the outcast, befriending the marginalized sinners on the fringes of what would be deemed as acceptable society. He's constantly affirming those with no worldly status to offer and sawing off the ladders, to borrow a phrase from David Zoll, of those who have it. Why? Because Jesus knows that the broken, darkened world is deluded with a false sense of status and what that world, worldly status means. He knows that our quest for greatness is the futile uh, drive to be loved and accepted, justified in some, some way that will give us peace and alleviate our fears. 
One more thought from Alan de Botton. He says, quote, life seems to be a process of replacing one anxiety with another and substituting one desire for another, which is not to say that we should never strive to overcome any of our anxieties or fulfill any of our desires, but rather to suggest that we should perhaps build into our strivings an awareness of the way our goals promise us a respite and a resolution that they cannot by definition deliver. Close quote. Jesus has come to cut the cord of status altogether, building and status, maintaining as a means of achieving peace or significance or purpose. When Christians minister to the poor and destitute, it's not play acting on the basis of a showy mercy, hey, look at me and what I'm doing. It's out of the reality that our status and theirs are exactly the same. Our deepest needs are exactly the same. Forgiveness, love, mercy, are what we need, and it's through Jesus that we receive them. The gospel levels us on one hand. No one is exalted above another. And the gospel raises us up on the other hand. No one is less than in dignity or worth. In light of our sin, we are all desperately needy. And in light of Christ's love, we are all extraordinarily valued, which is why the gospel both humbles us and dignifies us and holds us in that beautiful tension in which we follow Jesus. It sets us free, but how, may we ask? The gospel makes us supremely aware with both uh, our brokenness through sin and acceptance through our Savior. This allows us to be ourselves, whether we're with rich or poor, with simple or sophisticated, because through the gospel, we all have the same status. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. The great reformer Martin Luther described this gospel tension like this, quote, A Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. A Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject of all, subject to all, close quote, which is precisely who Jesus is and how Jesus lives. Paul the Apostle put it another way in Philippians, quote, Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, close quote. Jesus leaned into the resources of his heavenly Father's love and the Holy Spirit's anointing. It fashioned his sense of identity and it lit the way of his path and purpose. He was free from grasping at power, prestige, or control. He was free from the false expectations of the world and the false system of status and free to serve that very world all the way to the cross. Jesus emptied himself in love so that we might be filled. He forsook the game of status. Instead, he willingly took the status of poverty to give us the status of royalty. This is the quality of the grace, at, the grace of God at work in the lives of Jesus' followers. And throughout history, the remarkable explosion of the early church can be explained in part because of the way Christians welcomed into its fellowship the poor and the marginalized, the outcast, the foreigner, the whosoever will, whomever the Lord would draw into its fellowship were welcome, not on the basis of some worldly status of societal hierarchy, but on the basis of the status of the love of God in Christ. This is the significance of the meaning of Christ's cross, by the way. He was numbered among the non-citizen, the dregs of society, numbered among the most despised when he was crucified, hung there between two common criminals of zero status, of negative status. Tim Keller wrote, quote, The heart of the gospel is the cross, and the cross is all about giving up power, pouring out resources, and serving, close quote. This is the gospel. Christ the King, the Alpha and the Omega became utterly insignificant in the freedom of love to bring many children to glory. He took on no status that we might have the only status that matters, forgiven, loved, redeemed. Thanks be to God. Amen. Do you thirst for 
drink from the well Jesus is calling Who come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with the precious
Tell the world of the treasure you found Ooh, in Jesus. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ. The only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one being with the Father. Through Him, all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man for our sake. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried on the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. All right, everybody, thank you so much for being a part of our online worship experience today from wherever you may be connecting, whenever you may be watching this. We're so excited you're with us and our prayer for you is simple. The love of Christ over your life, the love and knowledge of Jesus over your life, nothing better. And if this online connection has been a blessing, we want to invite you and ask you if you would to share this with a friend, a colleague, a coworker, neighbor, somebody you know who could use encouragement today. And we appreciate that so much. And if you haven't already, we want to ask you as well to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can continue to receive our weekly content uh, that we are putting out each and each and every week. So thank you so much for that. So many ways to connect, discover, and grow with us here at SJC. If you're in the Wilmington area, we want to invite you to join us in person for worship. We gather each and every Sunday, 8.30, 10 a.m., kids ministry going strong all morning long. There's something for everybody here at St. John's. You can plan your visit with us just go to our website, Click Sundays, for more information. We look forward to meeting you in person and so many other ways to connect. Uh, we want to encourage you to grow in your relationship with Jesus. 
we grow in our relationship in Christ uh, as we venture forth together in community, as we journey with one another. You can learn more about getting involved with us and the many things that you can jump into and dive into here at SJC. Just go to our website, click the Event Hub calendar to pursue those many options. And we want to say thank you finally to each of you for your support of the vision and mission here at St. John. So many ways to get involved with us in the journey of support, time, treasure, talent. It all comes together in the body of Christ. We call that stewardship. But it's a way that we respond to the love of Jesus with our gratitude as we serve the Lord and as we give of our time and of our treasure uh, to make a difference in the lives of others. Nothing more exciting than that. And we want to encourage you and invite you to consider becoming a sustaining financial giver with us. You can learn more about giving. Just go to our website, click the giving button. Your gifts, large and small, they all add up to help us make a difference in the lives of others. So we appreciate your generosity and your financial giving. Uh, It's easy to do. It's secure. Again, just go to our website, click the giving button. May the Lord build in us hearts of generosity as we respond to the deep, deep love of Christ. Nothing better. God bless you today in your giving. I just love the idea that through the cross, through Jesus's own self-giving, Jesus, who was the king of kings, the royalty of royalty, humbles himself, takes on no status that you and I might take on the status of royalty. This gospel freedom allows us to love those around us regardless of status. It allows us to be set free from the need to live up to some status or to be concerned with status at all. We have the status of being loved, the status of being forgiven, the status of being redeemed through the gospel. What glorious, wonderful good news that is for me and you. It's been awesome to connect today. We wanna stay connected with you moving forward. You can find us anywhere and everywhere on social media at S-A-C-I-L-M. Hope you'll connect with us there. And friends, remember as you go today, Jesus loves you. He really, really does. And remember also that life is short. We don't have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. So let us be swift to love and make haste to be kind. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Until next time, everybody, take care.